<laughs> we are. We are the locals. I'm uh, Dr. Caroline McKay. I'm a social epidemiologist and associate director of health outcomes at Merck, and I will be moderating this session this morning on how do we engage minority communities in digital health strategies with the goal to reduce health disparities and promote health, health equity. Um, so I'll be um, introducing the panelists um, briefly and then uh, facilitating the question and answer period after the presentation. So with that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Cameron Norman, who is the principal of Sense Research and Design and an adjunct professor in the Dalai Lana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Cameron's research interests focus on the intersection of system science, design, and behavior science for health promotion and organizational change. The emphasis of his work is on program evaluation and modeling approaches to understanding complexity in social and health environments. He will be followed by Dr. Tamara Ginasar, who teaches health communication, health culture and diversity, intercultural communication, and organizational communication. And Dr. Ginasar has um, faculty appointments at the Department of Communication in Tel Aviv University and with the University of New Mexico. And her research interests focus on health communication and reducing health disparities. She's particularly interested in how communities and individuals are using new communication technologies for information exchange and advocacy, how they seek and share information, and on designing interventions using community-based research approaches to reducing health disparities. Dr. Jose Bauermeister is the John G. Searle Assistant Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education and Director of the Center for Sexuality and Health Disparities at the School of Public Health at University of Michigan. Dr. Bauermeister has led an academic community partnership focused on addressing the structural barriers fueling the HIV and STI disparities faced by black and Latino young men who have sex with men. Dr. Bauermeister is also principal investigator and co-investigator of several projects examining HIV and STI prevention with a focus on how to integrate prevention technologies. And Himena Loveluck is president and CEO of the HIV AIDS Resource Center. With that, I'd like to begin. Caroline, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to address uh, on the IOM and uh, talk a little bit about something that's become a big part of my life for the last while. Usually, I guess you'd say accidentally. I'm an ac accidental techno person. Uh, people call me the techno person. But it's often because um, I'm very interested in innovation and how people do things differently to achieve an outcome. And then what ends up getting entangled in all of that. And, um, and technology is, is a big part of that. Um, along the way, I also got very interested in health literacy, and partly because that's a means to engaging with these new tools. I mean, if you think about somebody who is health literate, um, there's a lot of great definitions. We have Ruth Parker, uh, who was talking, I mean, coined probably the most widely used definition out there. Um, but really what it is, is it's, it's practically people's ability to take an idea forward. It's an ability to learn. It's an ability to communicate. And that's ultimately what, uh, what literacy does. If you look at people who are able to do that well, they're highly literate, you know, whatever that, that term means. Um, literacy is really is that filter that mitigates our experience with the health system and, and, and life. And, and the more literate we are, the more we're able to connect to ideas and other people and then make something happen. And so what I'm going to talk about today, some of the, the things that I've learned um, about thinking about literacy Maybe a little bit different than, than what we've heard so far, maybe not. Um, and how it fits in with kind of the systems, and the systems that we design. I, it's a thrill to be speaking in the order that we are because I'm just thinking, I don't think I could have designed a better set of talks <laughs> in advance to really kind of serve as a platform for uh, the discussion we're having now. Um, we get digital information all over the place. This is from, I'm from Toronto, just up the road at 401. Uh, digital information is everywhere. There's people on their phones here. There's digital controllers operating the fountains. I mean, it's all over the place. And, and this is a scene that could be replicated in many cities throughout the world, of this kind of, of barrage of information. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in, and I said I, was a bit, like I often heard as a tech person, but really, I mean, I, I, I subscribe to what Melvin Kranzberg said, that technology is neither good or bad, but nor is it neutral. 
and it isn't about uh, creating great, better hammers, as to build on that analogy, and looking for everything being a nail. But sometimes we do that. And <coughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the systems that we use to create um, health environments. Um, many years ago, I was involved um, in uh, some projects looking at what was then the nascent World Wide Web and its ability to serve as a health platform. And people, there was a lot of debate, like every new thing, people were saying, there's no way this is going to work. I don't use the web. Why would anybody else use the web to make health decisions? That's ridiculous. This is, of course, the late 1990s. Um, one of the things that I um, realized, though, is that actually paying attention to the people that I was engaging with, mostly youth at the time, because they were high, they were the ones that were gravitating towards. They were interested in this. They were asking for this. And when, you, when I started to watch what was happening, I started to realize that we made all kinds of assumptions. We constantly do this, particularly with young people, is this idea of saying, well, young people, you know, they're, they're up on all the technology. They know how to do that. They know how to use all the latest tools. And that may be true to a point, but the degree of use within those tools is very different. And we've already heard about things like phone sharing. We've heard about all kinds of examples today already that show that things are quite different when you actually look at what technology is and the lived experience of, of that technology. And I realized there's a whole set of skills that are actually very sophisticated beyond just literacy. And um, I wasn't looking to come up with a, a term, but my, um, at the time, my doctoral advisor, Harvey Skinner, and I thought, well, maybe it's this concept called e-health literacy. Maybe there's something else, because we realize there's a lot more than just text. It's not just books, it's computers, it's other devices. Now, keep in mind, timeliness, and I thought the last comment around research to publication was interesting, because this was being done, the research was being done in the late 90s and early 2000s, published in 2006. And this is what eHealth literacy is, what we defined it as. We came up with a model, um, is defined as the ability to seek, find, understand, and appraise health information and make some decisions based on that. Um, now that was a time of what you might call Web 1.0. Uh, interestingly, a paper came out a couple of years ago, written by myself as an editorial, criticizing the health literacy model. Not, not in its entirety, but um, when you publish things, as most of us know who've done this, is that eventually then the, the, the benefit you get from that is you get to review all the papers that come after that that cite your work and build on that. And I read a lot of e-health literacy papers and, and health literacy papers applied to the digital environment. Um, but this was an editorial that came from having four papers being sent to me all at once. And the, and the, the, uh, the editor of the journal Gunter Eisenbach, this is in the journal Medical Internet Research, said, There's obviously this is getting hot at the moment, um, would you be willing to comment on that? And I said, sure. Um, and and there's some very interesting papers. Uh, but one of the things that I realized is that we had designed the health literacy scale was incomplete. The, the concept was designed for Web.1 world. It was designed for a world where we were getting better at communicating information out to the world. People were getting better at receiving it and taking action on it. But this was just published before, just as Facebook was just nascent. And then we have Twitter and interactive video on phones and things like that. And now we realize it is, is much more about being able to create part of the conversation and lead the conversation. And in fact, a lot of the very interesting conversations that are happening are not happening being led by us. They're being led by the public. They're being led by groups that are not engaged with us for a lot of reasons. And that's one of the reasons why, potentially, what one contributor to, to health disparities. But it's a choice that they're making for very good reasons. Our history around this is based on books. Again, this one-way push of information. If we can get it right, if we can get it framed the right way, the right evidence behind it, the right persuasive technology, we can get people to change their behavior. We know that isn't true. It's part of it, but it's a very small part of the equation. Um, we have new media, we have old media, and we have social media. And social media is about that creation of, of new forms of meaning. And interestingly, um, this is where you realize that what is new is not as new as we thought. Uh, I came across some of the work of Marshall McLuhan, just about anybody who is doing anything in technology has to at least at some point try to read some of that, <laughs> that work. And actually, it was uh, Edmund Snow Carpenter's uh, work, uh, an associate of his, that I actually came across. And this is a, this is a phrase. This was published in 1967. 67. Um, but he, he, he wrote a, a piece about talking about the new rules of journalism for students today. And what he said is that 
Um, here's the key to effective messaging. Know your audience and address yourself directly to it. Know what you want to say and say it clearly and fully. Reach the maximum audience by using existing channels. Sorry, I should mention, he is quoting what is the best practice of the day. His commentary after this is, whatever sense this may have made in a world of print, it makes no sense today. 1967. In fact, the reverse of each rule applies. If you address yourself to an audience, you accept at the outset the basic premises that unite the audience. You put on the audience, repeating cliches familiar to it, but artists don't address themselves to audiences, they create audiences. The artist talks to himself out loud. If what he has to say is significant, others hear and are affected. And I was caught by that. I thought he, it was like he, he saw Twitter and, and he was engaged with that. And what we are seeing and the real potential for digital media is this ability for us to be able to have, see, have people take responsibility take ownership of the issues and say, if, if others aren't going to do it for us, we will do it for ourselves. We will create our own audiences, which is an incredibly powerful possibility. But it does present a lot of challenges. Um, and, this, and this is part of the, I, I end up, uh, it's a, a paper, the idea of shifting us from readers to authors to artists. Now imagine what would happen if we thought about digital technology as a, as a collection of artists. And that use that term quite expansively. But this is the idea that, and, and um, it's interesting, that the concept of great artists steal has been floated out there. That great artists borrow from things. They, they recombine things. And they work within the systems that they're in to, to create something. And that's what I found quite interesting. And in a world where we are getting information that's coming in new and novel ways, we're getting we, you know, things like digital devices, wearables, that sort of thing. It's changing what gets created and how we create that and what kind of systems we create around those. So we see faster speeds, greater informational complexity. And that's really where I want to focus some of the, the things I want to share with you today, just sort of my reflections on thinking about 10 years, well, actually more than that, of, of, of work in digital literacy. The volume of content often gets um, Maybe a bit of short shrift. I mean, I don't know how many of you are saying, how many of you, does anybody in the room here think, I don't have enough email? No? <laughs> does anybody think, <laughs> problem to nobody. And that's just one channel. There's text messages, there's, there's Facebook posts, there's tweets, that sort of stuff like that. I thought the, uh, the story you mentioned about, you know, the idea of focusing on all the different things you had going on at once, that's our, that's our lives. That's the system in which we are in. Um, but if you look at the system, that's about also asking questions about the system. The systems that we've created of these information technologies frame that, in that context. So we're expecting people to make very complex health decisions about something very sophisticated, coming at it at light speed, and we're expecting them to do it on the fly and make really good <laughs> decisions without starting to question some of the systems that we've actually created. So this is the idea of technology not being good or bad, but it's not neutral either. This is a very powerful technology that was the dominant form for many, many years. It's paper, paper and pencils. But it's a good example to, to remind ourselves that technology exists within a system. Now we often don't think of this as a technology, but it is. It is, there's a tool, there's an input device, there's, the, there's, a, there's a capturing device. And, and if, in fact, you think about all the things that paper brings with it, you have to have a distribution se center. You have to have some way of getting paper from here to there. You have to actually create it. It creates waste. We were talking about carbon and e-waste. You have to have a place to put it, a file folder. You have to have a filing cabinet. You have to have an office space to put the filing cabinets in. We created all those things. We do the same thing with digital technology. And the question comes down to the big thing that we ask about technology that we fail to ask too often, is that what are we hiring this technology to do? If we go back, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> this, this, this is a great example of where technology works exceptionally well. This is the idea of actually being able to distributed cognition. The idea of saying, I'm going to write it down so I don't have to remember it. And this list that this, this kid actually came up with was fantastic for that. And in fact, the devices we have are pretty good for that. So in that case, it's working well. 
but what are some of these other things that are, that are happening? And, and I, what I might call is for, for you, for us collectively, is to think what are we gaining and what are we losing and what are, the, what are we hiring us or these types of technologies to do? Which may start to get us to question how much of it should we adopt, how much should we not adopt, what's the wait and see, that sort of thing. So this is an example of yesterday's uh, uh, Toronto Star newspaper, the big major paper in Toronto. Now, you might be a little bit, take a while to figure out what exactly am I looking at. If you are Porter Airlines, you're probably paying a lot of attention to the board of it. That's a lot of information. It's not obvious what this is. And this is, this is an example of a lot of the, the, the pieces of information that we get. We throw all kinds of stuff in there. What was the Toronto Star hired, what's the newspaper hired to, cert, to do? Now, obviously, it has to make money, so it sells ads around there. But at what point is all of that stuff diminishing the, its major purpose? I don't know. I get annoyed looking at this. I used to, to get the newspaper every morning and be thrilled to read up on what was going on in the world. Now I get annoyed when I look at that. We do this with health sites as well. Um, another thing I'd like, just like to put out, some of the technology that, that comes with this. this is, these are some examples, brilliant and horrible examples of what one might call link bait. So these are, these are actually from, this is from the San Francisco Globe. Um, you probably see these headlines all over the place. Very well crafted headlines that say, I don't know what happened next. A rude judge cut her off? She fired back, what did she say? I have no idea. And yet, what is, what's the point of, of, of that? Like, why, why am I spending my time on that? And this is just an, a, another example. But this is the environment. So when you're spending your time in this environment, these are the things this is the world of which people are, are interacting with. These are just some different examples. These are very well-crafted messages because they get people to click. And that's fine. Time is your life. Your life is time. So you, the more time you're spending on this, it's part of your life. But is that the life we want? This is just an example of health. And I use the, the most blatant example, type in health into, into Google, and, and you'll get Health Magazine. But look at all of the things that are coming around there. And this is the system that's going there. What was this hired to do? What are we hiring this information to do? So this is what we end up getting, is that we now have technologies that are hired to do multiple purposes that have multiple masters in that. And yet we are expecting to think about the bigger sets of issues. So all of a sudden, technology comes into different places in our life, like walking our dog, or walking across the street with a friend, or spending time with your friends all over the place or your loved ones, or your family, or having lunch, going on a trip, visiting you know, the sites, exercising. I have to laugh the idea of the app. There's actually apps that can real-time track your runs while you're doing it, which means you're actually running, like if you think about how that was designed. Or how about a game of golf <laughs> with your friends? Um, and, and what this does is it starts to point to the fact is that we're spending a lot of time. I, I don't think it's, I mean, we laugh at the time we talk about how long we can't spend time checking our email. Some of you might be checking your email right now. But this idea that, that we've created systems that, that really lock us into a lot of these things. And what I'd like to do is kind of question some of those things and the literacies around that because they can get lost in all of this that we're producing. Um, I just, I, I pulled this up. This was uh, an interesting study, a disturbing study. Um, to, <laughs> this was in science, actually. Sorry, I don't have the, the reference uh, down below, but I, I had to think about this. If you can't read at the back, I'm just going to read the abstract. It tells you almost all you need to know. This was published in Science, I think, July 11th. In 11 studies, we found that, f that participants typically did not enjoy spending 6 to 15 minutes in a room by themselves with nothing to do but think that they enjoyed doing mundane external activities much more, and that many preferred to administer electric shocks to themselves instead of being left alone with their thoughts. Think about that. Most people seem to prefer doing something rather than nothing, even if that something is negative. So think about that. I'd rather give myself an electric shock than just sit alone with my thoughts. Why do I bring that up? This is the big thing, is that when we start thinking about systems, we're spending a lot of time on events. But there is patterns underneath that and systemic structures about how this, this gets done. 
you can't think about the systemic structures when you're constantly focusing on the events. And, and that's the key thing. This is the, the lesson we learned from systems thinking. And I guess what I'd like to say is I was finding with my work on literacy, we're spending a lot of time up on the events. What, how can we get people to manage events better? But if we're going to reduce health disparities, it needs, it, they come from patterns and they come from systemic structures. And we could, you know, there's all kinds of different ones. How we set up our workplaces, how we set up our communities, how we set up our social systems. That is where technology has the greatest leverage point to make a difference. But only if we're thinking about it in that terms and we're not focused on, you know, what happened next at the, the contest. So it's this idea of technology is all around us, but are we seeing everything else in front of us? What exactly are we prescribing when we talk about technology? I don't have, I'm, I'd like to say I, I'm not, it's not like I've got the answer, but it's a question that we need to be asking constantly. Um, literacy spaces are shifting towards mobile. And I'm, I would argue that we need to start to think a little more. I mean, I, I agree with the idea that we do need to be thinking about what are individuals doing, but we can't do that divorced from the idea of what happens within the networks of which people interact. Because those collective areas, the only way we're going to change most of the systemic problems are systemically, and that has to be individuals making individual choices collectively in collaboration with one another. So you, you have to think about two things at the same time. Um, lastly, I'm just going to mention, because I'm, I'm running out of time here, but just to mention a concept that has been mentioned multiple times, my heart sang when I heard this, was the idea of design. And I got very interested in design from a, a, a position of, of understanding that is a way of creating things. This phrase from Herb Simon actually just blew my mind when I read it. Um, and I read it completely in a different context. But designers basically shape things. We can design these things. We can take these technologies and design them for collective well-being, or we can continue to focus us on events. So I think the question is ours to do that and, and the question of how we do that. Um, I have a case study. I don't really have enough time to, I can talk about this at, at, uh, at the break. Um, but what I would like to just leave you with is this phrase that probably a lot of us know in healthcare. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So my, my <laughs> caution is, is that are we designing a system that's perfectly designed for people to focus on events and have literacy around those things or something bigger? So we have to see things better from where they're at. I mean, I, I, I'm going to repeat stuff that's already been mentioned. We have to listen and then we have to lead. So thank you very much.